Good evening and welcome to tonight's regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. We'll start by uh, calling the roll and I'll turn it to our secretary. Yes. President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Baker. Here. Secretary Kaminsky. Here. Treasurer Brandstam. Here. Member Gordon. Here. Member, Member McFarland. Uh, he is absent. Uh, Member Vanderkellen. Here. Six, six out of seven, we have a quorum. Yes. Uh, from this, we'll uh, move on to the consent agenda. I'll remind the audience also, even though it's rather sparse tonight, to turn off the cell phones so we don't goof up the feeds on the, uh, on the microphones. Um, consent agenda uh, has the following items, approval of the regular meeting minutes, uh, staff and other resignations, approval of uh, some legal bills for through law firm, and that's it tonight. Any additions to the consent agenda or deletions to be made? Seeing none, I'll move into a motion. Move support for consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.4. Moved by Dr. Kaminsky. Do I have a second? Second. Second by his member, uh, Treasurer Brandstadt. Actually, could I make a correction? I think it's actually 2.3. 2.4. Uh, it would be 2.1, ah, 2.2 to 2.3. 2 okay. yep. Motion is for 2.1 to 2.3 with the agenda noted as changed. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Move on to requests to address the board. We have no uh, pre-requests. Anybody in the audience care to address the board? See none. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda, Board of Education Matters. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Ellender. Yes, these two, uh, we actually have two PowerPoint presentations, one on the technology, the potential technology bond election coming up on, on May the 7th, dependent upon the board's decision on the 20th of February and then a potential sinking fund election we thought we present some a uh, little more <coughs> detailed information an overview of both of those proposals tonight both for uh, your um, uh, point of view as board members as well as our audience here uh, for Roger and, and, and Betty and our viewing audience um, Mr. Verlendi along with some additional staff um, our um, technology director Blake Sobel and our curriculum specialist in the area of media, uh, Chris uh, Saburn, are going to present the first part of this. And really, these PowerPoints are coming to you as a recommendation from the Facilities Finance and Operations Study Committee. We thought it would be a great idea to get a little more public about this, and tonight's our opportunity to do just that. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Verlendi. Thank you. I'll turn it over to my <laughs> friends in IT and curriculum here in a moment, but I thought I'd... Uh, uh, get us started a little slowly here. Uh, we're going to start out uh, today's presentation with some MPS staff testimonial. Okay. Pretty good testimony to the power of technology and how it can be used for students to learn, not simply to learn how to use technology. That was the headline, where all these quotes came from. <laughs> August 27th, 1989. Might even recognize this person. <laughs> <laughs> young woman to my left, <laughs> who is quoted in this article. <laughs> and uh, I think Linda can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's back in the days of the Apple IIe's. But the vision was the same. Having students use technology to learn, to retain, to engage, um, to self-correct, to revise, for teachers to, with that technology, help students do all of those things. So the vision is really the same. I think you will probably agree with me that the technology has changed, okay? It can still do those types of things, but so much more beyond what we envisioned back in 1989, as so eloquently put by Ms. Linda Klein, okay? <laughs> so let's take this historic journey for just a second. I'm one of the oldest people here, so I can probably deliver it uh, with the most accuracy. Back in the days of the Apple IIe, 1989, 
prior to Proposal A. Okay? From that point on, we had all kinds of general fund pressure. You probably are aware of that over the course of the years, especially those of you who have been here uh, on the board for a long period of time. But in order to realize the vision with those Apple IIEs, we needed to finance that with general fund dollars, which, became un which came under so much pressure in the subsequent years to the point where in the 2000s here it has become uh, unbelievable. And actually, the vision that Linda talked about many, many years ago was based on a model of computers in a computer lab. Okay? You didn't pick up an Apple IIe, decide to take it on the bus home, and try to use it to search for facts, knowledge, um, all the details that you need to do problem solving, collaborative thinking. The tool was there, and it could allow you to do much of that, but it was hardly portable. And so in our schools, we put computer labs. At the elementary school, one computer lab. And over the course, since 1989, that's been our primary mode of delivering technology for students and how they um, access the information. The problem is, in that model, you're talking about students having access to a computer about one hour a week. I think things have changed over the course of time. And maybe moving away from something that is simply a computer lab, and we have done many amazing things with our computer labs over the years, but moving away from that model to bring the technology right into the hands of our kids. And that takes a whole new way of thinking. Now, as we look at how, how are we going to get there, well, let's look at where we've been in the past. General fund monies were dedicated. It took us a long time from 1989 up to the time where we could offer computer labs in all the schools, where we could network things because it was general fund money and we did it on a year-by-year -year basis and we eventually got there. We had, and we've been very fortunate, to have a few things that helped us along the way. One of those, the grant from the state of uh, Michigan to help us uh, give uh, laptops to teachers. Okay, those, those are boat anchors now, but back then that was uh, a big help and it took, relieved some pressure from the general fund. But most notably, 2.8 million from Dow Chemical and the community foundations here about four years ago, which allowed us to replace those aging boat anchors of technology and get our back room in shape so that we can deliver on a consistent basis uh, the technology, the information, the internet to uh, um, put it um, into the hands of students in the context of computer labs. Okay? And most notable here, and one of the reasons we're most appreciative for this grant, which has now expired, is that it set us up for a new age of using technology and getting it in the hands of the kids because we were able to get our back room up to speed <coughs> so that it can handle the next generation of technology, which we'll talk about here today. And secondly, most notably, we could not be taking any steps forward until such time as we could offer wireless throughout the entire district. And that has only come into fruition thanks to the last of the monies from this $2.8 million last October. So it's time for deciding where we want to go, what kind of model we want to use, and how we want to use it going forward. Because currently, capital expenditures are budgeted in our um, technology budget at $750,000 a year. Sounds like a lot. The problem is you want to put a device in the hands of all kids and all teachers, it will take you eight years to do it. And you better hope that the technology given the first and second year can last eight years. I don't know many of you that have devices that can serve you that long. Okay? And I guess the point I want to make is the message remains the same. We need to expand our technology offer offerings for teachers and students, but here's the key, in a manner that is sustainable. And our technology bond proposal, we believe, will support the following so that we can be in pretty good stead for an eight to 10 year period. Okay, enough about uh, uh, listening to me. Let's turn this over to Blake Sobel, our IT director.
significant improvement to our back room and our infrastructure uh, with the corresponding the superintendent in order to put us in this position where we can talk about growing things even more and taking it away from just the lab. Thanks. <laughs> you know how to work technology? Technology. Non <laughs> <laughs> <Down> switch. <laughs> The indie button. <laughs> so with support from the superintendent, general fund dollars, grant monies, we have grown our back room and our infrastructure, and we've realized this district-wide wireless network that has allowed us to pursue the initiative that we have going on right now with the iPads at the elementary buildings. This particular solution, though, in order for us to realize 8,000-plus additional devices is going to need to see some growth and some upgrades some of it right up front, and some of it later on. We're going to need to see refreshes of access points. Uh, we're going to need to see refreshes of some of the other networking equipment that we have out there at our buildings. Um, some of those other, uh, we need to ensure the reliability between all of our buildings with our fiber network, uh, battery backups. As far as some of the other network electronics, we're talking about switches, servers, increased capacity for uh, storage and archive. As we start putting devices into the hands of kids, what we're storing on our servers and out in the cloud is going to grow as well. The other thing that's important is that this particular infrastructure that we have in place in this one-to-one -one initiative is going to position us to be tech ready for the smarter balance testing that will take place in 1415, which is a requirement. And so we have to be able to assess our students online, and we can do that with where we're going with technology. We also need to ensure proper device and service management and monitoring. Uh, we need to make sure that the, we're able to support any kind of wireless printing and mirroring and sharing with the devices that we put in the hands of the kids. We also currently under under a lease contract for all of our copiers and our printers. And that'll go on for, I believe, another four years. So we have included in this particular proposal uh, funds to allow us to purchase those copiers and those printers, or new copiers and printers, I should say, in order to take some pressure off of the general fund, because that's something that's currently handled as far as the lease is concerned with those general fund dollars. The next thing we're going to talk about is security. While the safety of our staff and our students has always been a priority, technology has advanced as of such that we can start entertaining some other options to improve security in our buildings and also improve communication within our buildings. While we currently have badge readers and check-in procedures at each of our buildings to ensure that we know who's coming in and who's leaving, we can do more to protect our MPS family. Strategically implementing uh, some of the tools that you see on this particular slide will increase awareness throughout the buildings and throughout the district to help improve communication and security as a whole. It is critical that our front offices know who is in our buildings at any given moment. There will also be times, uh, hopefully there will never be times, but in the event of a crisis, we need to be able to communicate to all the people across the district and in our buildings so that we can take the, the necessary steps to ensure the safety of our staff and students. You see Enhanced 911 up on that slide. Enhanced 911 is actually a requirement as of December, or, or to be completed by December 31st of 2016. This is something we had originally planned to do with general fund dollars, but we can cover this now with bond funds uh, and take some more pressure off of that general fund. So at this time, I'm going to turn things back over to Chris. Chris is going to talk to you about some more of the bond details as far as the student and the teacher devices and the classrooms are concerned. Thanks, Blake. In our classrooms currently, we have the screens and the projectors and the document cameras. And the bond would allow for an upgrade to all of our classrooms of all of this existing equipment. However, it would also allow for the installation of enhanced audio systems. And in this scenario, the teacher would have the opportunity to wear a microphone. There would be speakers in the ceiling. And students, no matter where they are throughout the classroom space, would be able to very accurately hear 
what the teacher is, is saying or hand off the microphone to a student who's presenting and, and so on. Stepping just slightly away for a moment, I'll come back to the classroom. The bond would also support every student in the district getting a mobile computing device. And that's Im important. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But I wanted to touch on that because with every student having a device, we'd like to install a tool that would allow students to wirelessly project, which is called mirroring, from their device through the projector so that they can work on the 21st century skill collaboration from anywhere in the classroom. And the teacher would be able to do that too. Now the particular example we have on the slide is an Apple TV. There are other ones. This happens to be one of the most popular. But at any rate, when it's used, the next graphic shows you see a mirrored image from the iPad, which of course goes with the Apple TV, and then onto um, on a screen. But in our case that I'm describing would be the projector in the classroom. The bond would also allow for a more timely replacement cycle for teacher devices each year, and that's including, or that's uh, mostly referring to their laptops. If the bond were to pass, the goal would be for the teachers to have their laptop station in addition to the device that the students would have, so they can use that in in, their, in teaching and learning, both planning and delivery of instruction. Furthermore, the bond would allow for upgrades for specialized labs, such as the graphic arts lab and the CAD labs. That is an overall look at um, how this bond is important for sustainability of our technology efforts, and as Mr. Valindi said, should put us in good stead for eight to 10 years. But the big question, and from my curricular standpoint, is what will, go, what will going one-to-one -one with our students in computing do to help students be college and career ready? And what that's going to do, as Mr. Valindi also alluded to earlier, it's going to transform teaching and learning. A couple broad ideas. By going one-to-one, -one, students will benefit in that every student will have a device for use during the day and the potential access to the device outside of school hours. Learning will extend beyond our school walls, such as for recording field journals. The students could have increased ability for communication and collaboration, as well as access to more real-time and up-to-date, continually up-to-dated resources. One-to-one -one also reduces the need for physical labs. Now, I touched on the very specialized labs. wouldn't reduce that. However, um, general computer labs are hard to get into for our teachers. There's limited access out there. If the students all had a device for every hour of their day, there could be immediate access. And I'll speak more detail on that in just a moment. Um, Blake already touched on this, but I want to reiterate the Smarter Balance component. If we go one-to-one, -one, we could so easily support the Smarter Balance online testing requirements, which is required in 2014, as Blake mentioned. If we don't, with our limited computer lab resources, we'd be funneling mass amounts of students through few computer labs. And in essence, because that's a requirement, we would be taking away from the important technology integration in the lessons uh, for, the, for the other parts of the, of the day. OK. So I mentioned I'd talk a little bit more detailed. And what I'd like to do is share a little more detailed information about how one-to-one -one would support us. But I also want to share with you what some of our teachers have been um, saying who are actually in the action research initiative at this time. Real-time access. I've touched on that. You see a couple pictures on the, on the screen. Students have immediate access to productivity tools, such as word processing, spreadsheets, and email. They're creating their own presentations. They're taking video and sharing that with others. Um, but the teachers have said what is really great for them is the real-time instructional feedback. Mobile devices can be used as audience response devices so teachers can immediately evaluate student progress and use that instant feedback to decide to either remediate the lesson, continue as planned, differentiate for individuals, or expedite the pacing of the lesson as a whole. Uh, right now, teachers in the initiative are using apps where students are actually ab able to email their results at the end of the app to the teacher so they can assess their progress. And most specifically, a Dibbles app is being used to provide real-time diagnosis, and students also immediately get to see their progress. 
uh, also, with respect to real-time access, teachers are able to teach the tech-related concepts directly in the classroom rather than waiting to go to the computer lab. And I touched on that briefly before. Uh, specifically, uh, in the Action Research Initiative, with respect to research, Teachers are able to instruct students immediately how to look up words, images, and definitions using their electronic resources, but also using productivity apps to report out on their learning. Collaboration. Students are more effectively in a one-to-one -one environment, I'm sorry, to more efficiently collaborate with their peers and their teachers. Teachers in the Action Research Initiative reported back that they, in preparation for classes, are sending email communications to their students as well as work before the lesson starts, which is creating a more e efficient instructional time. Students are also emailing completed work back to the teachers for review, but they're also emailing work to their peers for collaborative uh, review. Um, what I thought was kind of exciting is we have some teachers who are answering questions of students off hours and on the weekends. And also students during the day who are really excited about their learning are emailing their parents real time and saying, look what I just accomplished. This is really great. <laughs> problem solving and critical thinking in a one-to-one -one environment. Students are able to solve problems more efficiently with the use of technology. Furthermore, students are learning what digital tools to use to reach their goals. Specifically, teachers are reporting that students are learning which apps to use to create content. Some are using a specific app called Book Creator, which is allowing students to write their own ebooks on topics, both fiction and uh, nonfiction. Or they could be using an app called Notes, which just allows them to jot down their thoughts. Uh, there's also apps that are used to rehearse specific content, such as math facts and geography content. In a one-to-one -one environment, personalized learning is more possible. A mobile device creates another way for teachers to differentiate for students. At this time, we're hearing uh, quite a bit of buzz in the classrooms about writing workshop. Students are busily typing and feeling more successful and more like writers. And here's, here's a big piece why. Some, of, some students, and not just special needs students, but some students feel slowed down by crafting the letters with pencil and paper. <laughs> now, I'm not in any way, shape, or form advocating that that goes away. That's not, that's not it. But when you remove that variable, the teacher in the classroom can teach the writing process, can teach the six traits of writing that we've worked so hard on as a district over the years, and allow the student to see how to craft a piece of writing more completely and more effectively and more efficiently. And they can work on the letter crafting with paper and pencil another time and bring the two together a little bit later. Furthermore, um, students, when the students are using an app to rehearse factual information <coughs> such as math facts, Teachers are reporting they're seeing an increase of speed and retention, as well as an increase in success when the students go back to using paper and pencil. In a one-to-one -one environment, creativity and innovation is, is amazing with the students. They're able to create content and show their le learning in new ways that they weren't able to before. Teachers are reporting back, as I've already mentioned, they're writing ebooks, they're creating videos, and they're creating presentations. And you can see the smile on that young lady's face um, as she's working on her presentation. For those of you who have heard me speak before, digital citizenship is one of my top priorities in this, in this role, talking to teachers about how to educate students to be safe in the digital world and be responsible digital citizens. Um, I encourage teachers as much as they possibly can to make that part of their common language. But when you don't have a device right there, that can be a challenge. However, if a device is there in a one-to-one -one environment, teachers are able to teach digital responsibility within the context of every single lesson that that device is used. Teachers are reporting back to us who are in the research initiative that students want to continue to use the devices. So you know what? They're following the rules that the teachers are setting setting forth for them. Also, they're taking very good care of the devices and being responsible digital citizens when they um, go out to the web. Now, the next part, to me, is the most important highlight of a one-to-one -one environment, and that's student engagement. Very specifically, uh, direct right to teachers reporting back from the Action Research Initiative, they're finding their students are more focused, they're more motivated, the engage, increased engagement 
equals increased achievement. Having the constant connectivity is increasing student retention. Specifically, our kindergarten teachers are reporting higher academic gains and the students are becoming more independent learners. They have seen their students reach out to others because they really enjoy teaching other students what they have learned and also um, sharing what they have learned with their teacher. My favorite story to report from all the stories that I've heard so far is uh, from one of the teachers in our upper grades, upper grade levels in the elementary classes, who uh, was teaching a lesson on the country India. And she shared with me that she was going to write the vocabulary words on the board, just like all of us would in the classroom and have the students talk about it, but then she stopped herself dead in her tracks. And she didn't write those words on the board. And she gave her students five minutes to take their iPads and find out what they could about the traditional clothing in India, the sari. So after those, after she said go, she said that the conversations in the room and the connections the students were making to their learning was absolutely incredible. In those five minutes, the students found out the appropriate way to wear the, the sari, what the colors represented, and finally how the sari was manufactured. And she said the amount of hours that she would have put into planning that wouldn't have helped the students really make the connections like what happened when they were searching it out and they found the pictures, they saw it, and they were able to immediately collaborate. She said it was an amazing time. So a final comment that I'd like to share with you is, is another comment from, from a teacher. And I gave this person a lot of credit for coming up and telling me this. She said, you know, Chris, at first this project was overwhelming. However, I'm not really sure what I would do without these mobile devices in the classroom. So, Mr. Valindi started this presentation taking us back in history. So just like in 1989, now our students are catching on quickly in 2013. Our adults are learning. Students are working at their own pace. Teachers and students are getting immediate feedback. And bottom line, most of all, students are enjoying their learning and making progress. I'll pass it back to Mr. Valindi. Okay, lastly, as we have reported, the bond proposal that we're going to be bringing to you is for $20.8 million, and it's broken out this way by color. Notice that the lion's share of this is put in the hands, in the hands of the students, a uh, device. And if you also take a look at classroom multimedia, that is about the Apple TV, the projectors, etc in the classroom, which will benefit the students and benefit the teachers in the presentation of material. The teacher devices is 9% of this. They need to become uh, the experts and, at, with the help of their students, the learners in this project as well. And um, as, you, as you can see, this is keyed on putting that technology in the hands of students to enhance teaching and learning. Carl? We can either take questions on this particular PowerPoint now that you might have as board members or we can wait until we do the sinking fund and deal with all of it in terms of millage um, together. What's your preference there? I'll defer to the other board members. Do you want to wait till the sinking fund or do the technology deeper now? Well, I would like to ask a few questions if I could. Okay. Now, is the infrastructure that you talked about, is that aligned with New Tech's infrastructure platform? Are we on? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the infrastructure pieces that we talked about are about our district, all of our schools as a whole, being interconnected. Um, so that um, basically uh, we want to improve reliability. We want to run some additional fiber between some of the buildings. So if a cut happens over here, we can continue to get service from over here. Um, it involves just all of the, the network switches that are out in all of the closets in each of our buildings that connect us all together. Um, some of that gear is new. Some of that gear is relatively old. And so we need to replace some of that. And because we're reducing the number of lab machines and classroom machines that we have across the district, 
there's no longer a need for us to replace those switches with such a high port capacity. So we can reduce that down and actually buy gear that's more suited for a mobile environment that we live in right now. Um, it also involves uh, storage capacity, it involves servers, uh, it could be replacements of some of our uh, virtual server environments, some of those, those physical boxes that run the virtual environments, some of those pieces are in there. Um, but it really, it's when we talk about the infrastructure, we're talking about all the technology that has to exist that nobody ever sees that allows all of our computers, all of our tablets, all of our printers and copiers to communicate, to talk, and to work. Um, we were in a meeting the other day, and Mr. Valindi mentioned the fact that people always ask, what do we do down here? What do you do down here? What do you do in technology? And one of the beauties of it is if we're doing our job, then people are going to ask those questions because they take that stuff for granted. Mm -hmm. If you know what we're doing, we're probably messing a few things up. <laughs> What, uh, what I'd, I'd like to just add one thing. Whatever device we use mm -hmm. for the new tech, mm -hmm. okay, obviously need to be consistent with the software that they um, utilize in new tech. What the infrastructure does is allow that no matter what device is used for new tech, okay, that is consistent with their software, can run on our network. So the short answer to the whole thing is, yes, the back room is simply about making sure that whatever device we have out there, in the case of new tech or anything else, can work with the system, can interconnect. When you get to, to uh, new tech specific um, specifications, what you're talking about simply there is with the devices used in new tech is what is the power of the device that's going to be used in new tech and is the operating system and its software compatible with the software that new tech uses. Um, if, we, um, if we do put this on a ballot in May and it gets approved, what is the time frame until every student in the district will have their own device? Uh, June 30th. I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> of what year? Well, <laughs> we, well we, talk a little we bit. are hoping to be pretty aggressive. But, quite honestly, we want to do it right. The worst thing that can happen is if we roll something out, we're not ready, we don't have enough of the background, and then there's confusion and frustration, that's going to hurt our efforts. So that ultimately will drive it. We would like to see that a lot of the stuff gets rolled out within the next two years. What levels, what times, what frameworks, we've run a bunch of different scenarios, but the number one thing is, that um, we make sure that when it does roll out, just like with the iPad initiative, mm -hmm. it can be used on day one with minor, very minor problems. And that has been uh, the case with the iPad initiative, if you talk to any of the teachers. Angela, I want to add that um, when we worked with the uh, financial um, experts behind the scenes, it will probably come out in the issuance of two different series of bonds and if I remember right, I think they said a little more than half uh, for the first four years, and then in year four or five, the remaining 45% or something like that. So it's not like all 20.8 million is going to be available, but the sale of the first series will happen within just a couple of two, three weeks of the, if there is an election, and if it passes, it'll happen fairly quickly. And I'd point out that really, the timing of this into two issuances is to our advantage as part of the planning because not just for the financial part of it, but um, any iPads we roll out here in the first couple of years, there are going to be new generations of iPad coming out within days of that. Mm -hmm. So really, this bond proposal is not about one device for a student, see you in eight to ten years. Okay, this is about two generations for each student mm -hmm. um, so that w w uh, the first part will provide for one device and then we will replace it or as the term we use, refresh, as we are going to be refreshing teacher devices and even teacher laptops. Thank you. It should really get the district in terms of its long-term budgeting out of the technology business for a minimum of eight years. It's very, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard to promise that, you know, as an absolute, because who knows what's going to happen in the world of technology. But um, 
All I could do is plan based on what you know now, and, and, and that's how we'd move forward. And plan flexibility. That's the key. Yeah. Is there's, there's build flexibility because you know it's going to be different than you think. Yeah. That's all you know. John? Um, there was something that was mentioned about the smarter balance testing. I think it's a state requirement coming up, what, 2015? Spring of 15. Or yeah. Spring of 15. What would it look like if we tried to use our computer labs now to try to get everybody standardized tested within a very short period of time? That's a good question. <coughs> very good question. Just, we're going to get, get a first-hand look at that. Okay. Some of our schools have been invited to uh, run one <coughs> or two grade levels of the test for the state to use that data as far as the test and what the results are, but the ability to do it. And our schools are taking that opportunity. I'll give you an example. You have uh, Dow High School, 15 to 1,600 students. Uh -huh. They were invited to do two grade levels at that building, 800 students, which would mean uh, that we would have to run uh, for two tests 800 students through a computer lab in a window of time that they gave us, which would mean that graphic arts lab would have to be used and we'd have to not teach graphic arts for some, or we have to be very strategic, use the other labs, and try to work them through. We are only going to do at Dow High, for example, one grade level and try to make that work as best we can, but it's going to be a scheduling nightmare to try to do it in the window, but we want that experience in the first place. Northeast, We'll be doing one grade level that will provide its middle school experience with it. And we have three elementaries that we'll be doing it. But when you have a mass um, of uh, population at a particular building, especially the bigger buildings, you only got so many labs. And if the test takes, you have to put a window for one test of two and a half hours, and you've got to cycle all the kids in that grade through it, imagine that that's going to really eat at the schedule. Whereas if we had one-to-one -one devices, for example, let's just say that we went with the iPad, all the students could be taking it at the same time. And for example, we do know with the iPad that it will be consistent with smarter balance test. So we'll have some experience that, on that. That's uh, going to be pretty interesting. I'm hoping that like that's the experience the that we don't have to do going forward. But it would seem like it would be fairly disruptive to the school schedule trying to get that much standardized testing done out of the existing computer labs. So kind of a disconnect, again, with the state requirements and what we actually have. And I'm, I'm assuming they're going to give us a lot of money to uh, get one-to-one -one computing. No, but we'll get a nice out. thank you card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, but it, it's a great question, Dr. Kowalski, <laughs> because uh, the state has developed what they call the technology readiness grants. And we've applied, actually, all the county, all the school systems, the districts in the county have. And you have to, at least in initial stages, work through the ISD network in the state of Michigan. A and the state uh, just got a survey back from school districts to see what the readiness is across the state of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And in some places, it was not a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. it, so um, I think it's very astute of us to get out on this on the front end and get prepared. And if we can convince our community of the value of that, because we'll have no choice but to, to use the, the technology for that assessment in the spring of 15, that will be here before we, you know, much quicker than we think. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions for this part? Well, I do have one more question. Meridian is switching over to BYOD, bring your own device, because they're finding this is unsustainable to provide all the student devices. Did anybody look into that? Yes. Uh, number one, I'm not aware of Meridian going to BYOD. I talked to Norm Near a couple of weeks ago, but we hadn't touched on that. And I don't know if that's in place of providing the laptops for new tech or if it's well. in other grades. But uh, yes, we've spent a lot of time looking at BYOD. Um, here's our problems as far as BYOD. Right from the very beginning, this has been about universality. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, Going forward, we don't want any of our kids to be the technology haves or have-nots, okay? And we know that, although it's not a great majority, we have kids who go home to places that do not have internet or do not have those computers, okay? Secondly, uh, when you're talking about BYOD, you're really kind of restricting yourself to high school and maybe a little bit of middle school because most kids at elementary and middle school, their parents won't let them have a data pack uh, smartphone um, and uh, that can be problematic. So 
So you're going to have some kids, at the, if you do it in middle school and high school, you have some kids who will have access and others who won't. Just the uh, cost of a data pack on a smartphone at, uh, for some families is uh, um, pretty difficult, and some parents don't want their kids um, to have smart, uh, smartphones. Mr. Verlin, so that's they, couldn't they access uh, via Wi-Fi with their device? They could if they had a device um, that um, um, had the Wi-Fi on it. Uh, some of them just have the 3G. Uh, the other problem that you've got with uh, BYOD is some of those devices they'll bring in uh, will not be compatible with smarter mail. Okay, so we can't use that as something. If they don't bring in a device at all, they won't have it, and because of free and appropriate uh, education laws, um, if we don't provide that for every student, then we can't require it. So all of our instruction is going to have to be based on uh, the fact that they don't have it, but letting those who do have it use it. And the only commonality would be across all these devices, because apps are specific uh, uh, to iOS or Android or whatever the case may be. The only, only <coughs> uh, common platform that they will have is if, you, uh, if they come in with a smartphone or a tablet, w whatever kind it may be, is the web browser. That's the only commonality they will have as far as what, uh, do, what apps they're using for document creation, what uh, apps they're using for um, creating uh, projects and movies, et cetera. So you lose the uh, consistency across the board. So it can be an, a an added resource to an individual student, but because it's not common across the, pla uh, the population, it's going to really be limited as far as an instructional tool per se, other than to say, if you have your smartphone, see if you can look that up. Gary, there's another issue too. I had lunch with Craig Carmody there, superintendent oh, on Friday, Kim. Okay, great. A and one of the things that he had pointed out, what, and I don't know if this is related to their Gmail or if it's their BYOD devices, is up to a certain age level, kids are restricted, and we have to be very careful on how we work with them. I forget what exactly 13. what that reference is. Right. It, and so they're having a little more trouble moving to Gmail with all their students for kids that are under 13 just because of the legal restrictions that are there for how they have to use that technology, and they're struggling with that right now. So we have to be really careful. I think what I see in this technology bond initiative is enough flexibility in room that if we went down a new tech path, we could probably accommodate the technology needs. We've had Dave, Dave Diesek, our one of our uh, technology managers, attend our visits to new tech school, so he understands what's required. And I think we can do that with the flexibility this would give us without duplicating services. Right, and we actually have built in for a new tech model beyond the original startup cost that we might be able to get so that we can sustain it beyond when that grant or that donation um, uh, might expire. Any other technology questions? I have one that uh, parents often ask me, and we've talked about it at the different committees, but I'd like to hear you talk about publicly, is firewalls, protection, children, protection, et cetera. Do you care to comment? Yes, uh, right from the beginning of this iPad initiative, we've been committed to that uh, um, all of these devices will be filtered through the Newland Public Schools filtering system that we have set up. Um, so we, they go through a proxy and then actually into our firewall. Um, so what uh, they, they have that filtering um, at home if they have this device the same as they do as if they were at school. Okay, and that, that is a priority for us, and quite honestly, I've heard from a number of parents that I've talked to at Kids Day in the Mall, and their kids uh, um, uh, happen to be in one of these classes. That was the, the, a key thing for them, and they have found uh, that that has been uh, very important and has helped them embrace this whole effort with their child. Thank you. Good question. Uh, just one other point of clarification. Uh, when at our meeting with Treasury, I think they told us the average millage associated, associated with the 20.8 million and the issuance of the two bond series would average out to about 0.88 mils. Uh, could be a little higher than that at certain points. 
Um, if it's different than that, correct me now, uh, Mrs. No, that, that's the average. <laughs> yeah. So, so for this piece, minus what we're going to talk about with the sinking fund, it would be a request to the voters of on average, um, and that will go up and down. That's not a, it can't be the same number every year. Uh, on average, it would be uh, 0.88, at least as part of our pre-qualification application. And Carl, just to be clear, it would be a very narrow range that it would vacillate in. Yeah. You know, you're, you're talking the second well, decimal point yeah. type of uh, type of range, you know, 0 0.88, 0 0.90, 0.87, that type of range with the variable uh, property rates. There, there's or, some new language we heard from our attorney since we were down actually with Treasury, uh, Mr. Wasserman, and it, uh, we have to phrase it based on some new legislation that passed that indicates to the public there can be that range there. And yeah. nobody is particularly pleased with what that language is, and we're waiting on officially what that would look like. But it's the last sentence that would be on the ballot language, and we'll have that ready for you, assuming it's ready on February 20th. On February 20th. Great. Ready to move on to um, sinking Thank fund? You. Yep. <clears throat> Well, as you know, we're coming off a, a sinking fund that ended with last one, uh, winter's tax collections. And uh, that was originally set up to be uh, two mills um, that generated roughly about $5.5 million for each year of 10 years. If we had uh, um, levied that, to, if you had levied that two mills for, um, for that full length of time. When the county um, decided, w with the acknowledgement and approval of the local boards, to go after the enhancement millage in year 8, 9, and 10 of that sinking fund, it was the decision by this Board of Education to reduce the sinking fund from 2 mils down to a 0.5 mil. Um, and that difference of 1.5 is what our voters paid for the sinking fund in the first three years of the five year enhancement millage. And that enhancement millage is due to come due again, I think, about a year and a half from now, um, May of 2014. And uh, that'll be another consideration for this Board of Education. And can you afford to do without that revenue? Um, on the other hand, if you go back um, 15 to 18 years ago in this school district, um, I think due to some very strategic planning on behalf of former board members, uh, there was roughly a billion dollars a year that was reserved in your uh, general fund budget to take care of capital needs. I think the official name of that was PRME. Um, that generated a lot of money over the years. Um, a million a year still is not a lot of money. I was just thinking about this as I was driving back for the board meeting tonight. Where I came from, we built a brand new middle school that was on about um, uh, 24 acres. And um, the cost of that middle school, one middle school for up to 1,100 um, students was around $27 million. So if you look at the, uh, just that as a comparative figure, um, my guess would be across the district, Linda may know this off the top of her head, that we w have well over 200 million, maybe closer to 300 of uh, value in our facilities alone here in the district. 240. So if you're only able to put a million a year like the board did, you still have to be very careful. And we haven't been able to put that away for a long time. And we've been fortunate that we've had the sinking fund that allowed us to invest in upgrades throughout the building. But that work is not done. Let's review a little bit uh, about what that work uh, has been in the past. Sinking fund dollars have been used to renovate and keep our building safe and comfortable for our students. You see that sign that's up at most sites uh, where we've been doing the sinking fund work for the last 10 years. It's paid for roof replacements, but not everywhere. For example, at Woodcrest, there's a roof there that's going to have to be replaced. Um, it's created safe and level cement. If you spend much time wandering around our building and grounds, um, it looks a little bit like a hodgepodge because you can see fresh cement versus old, but it's not always level. So that's something that we track on an annual basis that just takes an investment of funds. We've improved driveways, as you can see here. Whoops. Uh, we've made improvements to gymnasiums and bleachers, some required by changes in school code. If you're in the uh, Midland High Gymnasium, you see that thin cable that goes across between the pipes. Um, that was all recommended by our insurance company and paid for with sinking funds. 
uh, improvements in our classrooms. I mean, they look like modern day classrooms. The lighting made a tremendous amount of difference. There's still electrical and ceiling upgrades that have to happen in some of our buildings. Um, I think one of the areas uh, in the district that we're most proud of are the improvements in our music rooms throughout the district. The renovated community stadium, the work in the main corridors, ceiling and lighting replacement, and, and there's more. Um, there's like a total of 42 or 43 million dollars of improvements that's taken place in the last 10 years. We've identified the next almost 60 million of improvements that we still um, need to do. Um, we probably wouldn't do everything on that list. Um, but let's take a look at what criteria we use when we're talking about a sinking fund and how projects are actually uh, chosen. And this has guided how we have used that money for the last 10 years. We've tried to keep safety of students and staff at the forefront of our minds. You have as a board, and so have we administratively. We take a look at the bidding climate and the scheduling and the school calendar issues because, as you know, most of this work has been done during the summer. Uh, very little has had to disrupt um, the calendar, the school calendar year. Take into account the cost, energy savings, which is still a consideration for us and what we're going to propose to you this evening. We tried to share equity, so there wasn't any particular building that felt like they were the favored son or daughter of the board and make improvements in, in all our sites. We have solicited public and community staff input, and I'm going to talk about what that process looks like uh, a little later in this presentation. Uh, building repair issues, we've considered obsolescence so we can actually plan for what we know is going to come due that will cause us to have some expenditures. We looked at what we can do to enhance the curricular experience for our staff and our students, the number of students that are impacted, and then overall the space needs based on enrollment. Um, and programs that we offer. There is something called the Capital Projects Program Schedule, and step one in that really is to solicit information from the buildings. Um, late in the spring, right before the school year ends, we ask our building principals to reach out to their building manager to give their teachers an opportunity to weigh in on what needs they have uh, in their individual buildings. And then the agenda group, along with Dave Costas, who has been the uh, bond point person, and some of our building and grounds um, staff, uh, Joe Yatch, when he, before he'd retired. We typically go out and we visit each one of the buildings so we can eyeball and the agenda group can actually see for itself um, what those priorities are. And very rarely do we disagree with the priorities that are, um, are, are fed up, um, fed to us uh, in the organization. Um, Step two is we present a uh, three-year plan to the Board of Ed. So even though we know there was um, uh, collections coming in every year for 10 years, every fall we bring a three-year plan over what we think are the highest priorities as your administrative team to the board. And then you adopt that typically early in the fall. Sometimes that can go as late as October. But then annually of that three-year plan, the board always has an opportunity to weigh in based on what you see and your area of, of expertise. And you may modify that three-year plan um, as we go through those three-year increments of a 10-year plan. You have the opportunity to modify that annually. <coughs> so just a few examples of how the funds were used in the past. Uh, there's been an investment of over $6 million in the elementary buildings and over $5 million in the middle school. And I'm not going to read everything on the two lists, but often those things you could apply to just about any building here in the district, from the parking lot improvements to restroom upgrades, um, those would be the typical types of things that, that school districts anywhere in the country would spend uh, their capital uh, project dollars on. And there's more examples. We've put over $23 million um, into the high schools uh, and across the district over $8 million in other improvements. And again, you can see what those are from classroom additions to gym additions to the more technical things like electrical ceiling and lighting upgrades, things as uh, 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 basic as floor tile replacement, concrete fence repair, et cetera. So the 10-year sinking fund uh, spanned um, this time period. We want to thank the community for making more than $43 million of building renovations and improvements possible through this sinking fund. I can't stress enough how absolutely important it is given how funding um, flows through from the legislature 
to local school districts to continue maintaining this sinking fund. Without it, I just don't know with our budget and given the kind of wages that we pay and meeting our community's expectations, I just don't see any way to uh, uh, meet the needs of improvements and renovations throughout the district and continue to be one of those top 10% school districts in the state of Michigan. Future sinking fund project ideas, energy controls. I think we have a staff in place to continue taking education. Specifically, Mike Mulgenberg is um, working on another degree uh, for him. And between he and Linda, they're very on top of our energy needs. Uh, in fact, I think at our next board meeting, we may have a company come in and present to the board uh, even another alternative for how we can take a look at managing our, our energy cost in the district. Unit ventilator upgrades throughout all, throughout all the buildings, they're huge. They can be anywhere from 400,000 to a half a million per building um, that we have not been able to make a priority because we had higher priorities in the first 10 years. Still some heating system replacements in some of our buildings, replace the air handling units, some boiler replacements, uh, alluded to the technical upgrades, um, server room relocation here in this building because we're growing out of that server room. Um, there's a need to replace um, decades, multiple decades old galvanized piping. When we get underneath the buildings, and Dave Costas tells me when we go in and we look at the galvanized pipe, it is in fair to poor condition around the district, so we have to uh, pay attention to that. If you've been in many of our buildings, you know, we still need to look at parking lot upgrades, and we still have traffic issues in some of them if that's a priority for the board. Again, going back to energy uh, enhancements, um, entrance door replacements and door hardware replacements, roofs, restroom upgrades, concrete asphalt, fence repair, um, elevator upgrades in buildings where we have elevators are important. Um, Central Middle School, a new tap program, there could be as much as $4 million that could be invested in that building to make it a showcase new tap program. I would remind you that the survey that we took showed um, surprisingly strong support for that. Um, uh, so that's a good sign, I think. Very high on the list, uh, in all honesty for me, probably uh, the top item would be um, Science Labs renovations. Uh, we've known that would be a high priority um, if our community supported a sinking fund, and we've had conversation about that for at least the last two or three years, knowing that uh, that's where we could park this expense and uh, use uh, taxpayer-generated dollars of a sinking fund to pay for that. Clock and PA replacements, you heard that as part of our uh, security issue that was addressed earlier tonight. You would probably be surprised to really take a look at the floors and all the buildings that you visit to see the shape of some of the tile. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a simple process because often that has asbestos underneath it, mm -hmm. and that creates extra costs when you start bringing that up. Um, uh, we surveyed our community to see how they would feel about uh, a recommendation from a community pool study group about uh, Dow High School pool lane additions uh, and perhaps even renovations. Um, that could be part of this group. Locker replacement, um, tennis court maintenance and renovation at Midland High School. It's time to pay attention to that. Bleacher repair and renovations throughout the district. Art room additions and renovations. We have quite frankly, uh, a world-class art program here at Midland Public Schools, and we're outgrowing uh, the outdated facilities that we have in that area. If you have not been in the little theater in the basement of Midland High, and you go down there and look, it's hard to look at that and look at the shape of the chairs, the overall condition. Um, I think it's useful life, uh, needs some renovation. And then the music room at Jefferson Middle School, uh, I would add, even at Northeast, needs some renovations, especially with more students accessing that now. And there's much more uh, that could be there. Um, we have a list building by building of what we think the needs are that we've generated over the years. And it didn't take long to get to 60 million. And I guess I would challenge most people to take a look at what I've reviewed here with you and say, you know what, there's not a lot of um, excess um, construction going on or excessive excess uh, excessive construction. It's things and investments like this, I think, that really show an investment in quality education. And I think it's the kind of thing that our community expects to at least ask them if they're willing to uh, provide the funding for that and let them make that decision.
So what's next? We have a special board meeting coming up that we've alluded to uh, to see about putting a vote to these on the May 7th ballot. It would be a recommendation from us to the board and actually from your FFO committee uh, that it be a sinking fund for two mills uh, over a 10-year uh, year period of time. Based on the current SEV, one mill would generate $2.7 million, so two obviously would be in a range as SEV changes over time of from 5.4 to 5.7 million. And then the uh, 20.8 million technology bond proposal to replace the aging technology equipment and arm the district with sec technology, uh, security technology and provide the personal technology tools that we've alluded to um, earlier this evening. Timeline for the sinking fund and technology bond. On Friday, January 11th, we met with the Department of Treasury to finalize the, pre the preliminary qualification. To the best of my knowledge, um, Linda or Gary, I don't think we've received notification that that's been approved yet. So we're kind of waiting with bated breath on that. Um, I can't imagine that it won't be, but who knows what happens down in Lansing these days. Uh, Monday, January 14th, uh, the board approved that uh, preliminary qualification. We talked about the meeting on the 20th. By Saturday, March 23rd, uh, if we're going to have an election, we have to uh, make absentee voter ballots available, voter ballots available. Monday, April 8th would be the last day to register to vote, and Tuesday, May the 7th uh, would be election day with polls opening at 7 a.m. and closing at 8 p.m. We would be remiss, I think, as we have this initial discussion and get it out in front of our public if we just didn't take time tonight to thank our Midland community for so really supporting uh, Midland Public School students, staff, and our programs. It's very clear that we couldn't be the district that we are without the, the, the support of this community, and in particular our parents and our businesses and so on. It is a, uh, it's a great place to uh, be in the education business, let me tell you. And historically, a very supportive community I can't tell you the number of people that have approached me in the last two or three years, even since the enhancement millage, who have said, Carl, why do we wait for the state to solve our funding problem? Why don't you come to us, the voters, and ask us for what we can do for students and children here in the Midland community? And it would be my recommendation to you as your superintendent that you give the community to weigh in on exactly that, give them the opportunity to, to weigh in on it. I'd be happy to take questions. Um, we're not asking you for any action. This is just now in front of you for the first time. And then, of course, when we have the meeting on the 20th, that'll be the opportunity to take action on both these recommendations. Any questions? Just Can you reiterate <coughs> that the list that you put up is just suggestions? And, well, you know, sorry. three years from now, if someone sees this list and says, well, I think such and such should be a higher priority that will continue to reassess that. Yeah, it's a really great question, Angela, because um, you, you could look at different interested parties, be it from athletics to other people that would like to see enhancements in their area of the curriculum that we offer. Um, we will come up with broad categories, much like my understanding is the district did the first time for the sinking fund that says here's where we would limit this money is to be spent, and then I think it's astute for all of us to only spend money in those areas. But those categories need to be broad enough. It's really hard to define, you know, in 2013 what you might spend money on in 2018, for example. And um, I know that can make some um, voters and some of our parents nervous, you know, unless you can be exactly very specific about what you're going to spend every dollar on. But when you think about it, that's really not in the school district's best interest because the more you can have a little bit of flexibility and live on the integrity that you've earned with the community for the most part with how those sinking fund dollars were spent the first time around, I think this community would trust your, your lead. Okay. Any others? Just, just one thing I wanted to ask is uh, how new is our newest building and what's the average age? I mean, because you never know just what you're saying is you may never know whether there's seven things that go out or two boilers or three of this and that and um, or what requirements may be down the road and yeah. I think the flexibility is pretty wise but how old is uh, or how new is our newest building? Our newest buildings were completed in 1968 
and the average age approximately? Uh, average age, we had to do a weighted average age for the uh, bond application, and I want to say it's about 58 years at least. Okay. And that takes into account any additions that were made. Now, if you're looking at just the age of when the buildings were constructed, sure. it's probably closer to 60, 65 years. Sure. Some of them almost 80. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just like the flexibility in that, and and that plan going three years out. There's wiggle room with that up until the year that you set those projects. So, yeah, it's a questions? process that I think has served the board really well because if you had advocates for a particular program, they had the opportunity to come to you as a board and say, you may not be able to endorse this right now as making a modification just on short notice in the very next year. But they have an opportunity then to advocate with you on how that could be incorporated into something as short as the second or the third year of that three-year plan. And I was impressed when I realized that that process was in place here because that is one way to keep your community happy because they have the opportunity to speak directly to you about what they think should be a priority and then you either respond or you don't. And I have one question for Blake. I saw you put on a class the other day about Survey Monkey. Would we be able to use that to be able to get community input? Was that you or no? <laughs> Cindy, why don't you put the screen up? <clears throat> oh, that wasn't you? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I guess I, I'm sorry, I don't fully understand your question. You mean to collect information from the community? Yeah, or? from the community to be able to get input. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've used, um, we've used SurveyMonkey previously, Zoomerang, quite frankly, to collect information from the community from anything to, you know, Gerstacker Awards to when we were even doing consolidation work of the elementary schools. Um, yeah, we've most certainly used that as a resource. And we could just put it up on the first page of the website and people could go and fill out the survey to tell us what they are thinking? Depending on how we designed it, yeah, there's there's lots of options. Okay, awesome. Sure. Any other comments on sinking fund? I would just make a comment that the sinking fund um, being here about a year before, I think, before we initiated it. And so impressive to watch how that process worked over those 10 years. And the one that specifically comes to mind um, was the process with the band rooms and how there was so much community input. We worked with the band directors, you know, the, the, the um, experts in the field. So I think uh, we've, we've done it well and I hopefully we will be able to do it in another 10 years very well. I'm, I'm reserving mine for the end. Um, starting to become the resident historian here, <laughs> Lynn and I. Um, but this also harkens to uh, my many days at Dow and manufacturing at Dow. You know, Linda said a very good point. We're based on the asset value of our buildings, replacement asset value of our buildings. This is about a 2.3 percent a year request of infusion. That's a pretty small replacement uh, rate, and in the end, we're saving big bills for new buildings, etc. And I would point out to everybody in the public that. Uh, some of us, again, resident historians have been around. The, the new high school down the road that some people attended is no longer the new high school. <laughs> it's, it's, getting on, it's getting on age. And uh, maintaining these kind of facilities in the shape they are is a credit to and thanks to our community for the sinking fund. And if we don't continue to do that, it's just a matter of time before the bills are much bigger and much larger. About 65-ish percent, 70 percent of this is for those kind of things, and the other 35 is what I would call for enhancements uh, to uh, the sciences, to the arts, uh, to those other places that uh, continue to enhance the quality of the education we have, not just the physical infrastructure being in good shape, et cetera. And as a former football official, I can tell you back when I first ran for the board, I can remember going to many school districts that have brand new Taj Mahal looking facilities that are just great. And five years after going to them, they're all beat up. Lockers are beat up, et cetera. And I really appreciate our community, our kids, our staff's respect for the facilities we give them. 
and our keeping them fresh helps them have the attitude to keep them fresh and not have to build new Taj Mahals to give a good experience to our kids. So with the 2.3% replacement at buildings that are 80 years old and the new ones being 45 years old, uh, the adroit management and looking after the taxpayers when we did the enhancement millage, and I will repeat that out loud, when we did the enhancement millage for the Midland MPS taxpayers, we cut the sinking fund at the end, as Carl alluded to, to keep them neutral in the tax. And if you remember when that period of time was, it was right at the heart of the recession and the downturn. And uh, when you look what's happened to our major companies happening here over the next couple of years, we're looking at the same kind of thing. So I hope the taxpayers do appreciate that we've been good stewards of their money. It's one reason we haven't gone back to the sinking fund immediately and have the time gap is to give some relief for a while uh, during turbulent economic times. And now this will allow us to, to refresh and keep the buildings going. So just wanted to put that perspective out there for folks to understand the history. And thank you to the Bettys and crew that years ago came up with the PRME millage. It was a millage uh, that the town approved to do this kind of reinvestment in our in our facilities. And while it was a million dollars, a million dollars back in the, I think it was the 80s that was approved, if I'm not mistaken. You know, a million dollars in the 80s was two and three million dollars a year today of equivalent spending. And to have that foresight, and then when Prop A came, we were no longer allowed to do that millage. And the boards at that time had the foresight to say, let's continue to dedicate funds out of the budget to continue to do that. And when that started becoming a real pinch point with the funding from Lansing, we went to the sinking fund to enable the local community to pay for those things versus using the precious funds for operating funds that we were getting from Lansing. So that's kind of the history. Um, and just thank the taxpayers and I hope they'll support us again. Thank you. Okay. Four on to you, Carl. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're going to move over to Linda for the uh, for the budget. I'm sorry. The, uh, or the incentive for the, uh, the best practices. practices incentive. And Dr. Kaminsky will have his uh, first opportunity to read a board resolution, and we're breaking him in rather nicely. It's not going to be a multi-page tax resolution, <laughs> uh, but just <laughs> as background, Section 22F of the 2012-2013 State School Aid Act provides $52 of grants to districts that satisfy at least seven of eight best practices criteria no later than June 1st of this year. You may remember last year we had about twice that amount, and I believe it was for four out of five best practices. And because it was rather new and we weren't sure exactly how we would qualify, we didn't include it in the 11-12 budget originally, but then put it in mid-year. A little different this year. It's already in the 12-13 budget. So if you choose to not support the resolution, we're going to need to modify the mid-year budget adjustment that you're looking at. But <coughs> included in the original budget is $421.46. Uh, $421,046, uh, and that is $52 times our blended count for 12-13, and we did that in anticipation of qualifying. So without going into all the details, since you will hear it in the resolution, I will turn it over to Dr. Kaminsky to read to you which of the seven of eight <coughs> we are certifying. I'm very gladly uh, to read this, uh, this resolution. Uh, Best Practices Incentive School Board Resolution, whereas Section 22F of the State Board Aid Act provides $52 per pupil one-time grants to districts that satisfy at least seven of eight best practices criteria not later than June 1st, 2013, whereas the Board of Education of Midland Public Schools desires to receive the $52 per pupil incentive payment, whereas the Midland Public Schools has satisfied at least seven of eight best practices criteria whereas eligibility for the incentive payment is contingent upon adopting a resolution that states the district has complied with the following seven of eight best practices criteria. Now, therefore, be it resolved as follows. Number one, uh, the Board of Education of Midland Public Schools certifies that the district has complied with the following requirements. The district is the designated policyholder for medical benefit plan 
um, pursuant to section 22F1A, the district has obtained a competitive bid on non-instructional services pursuant to section 22F1B, uh, those being food service and custodial services. The district accepts applications for enrollment by non-resident applicants under section 105 or 105C pursuant to section 22F1C. Uh, district submits to Michigan Department of Education a plan that shows progress towards developing the technology infrastructure necessary for the completion of pupil academic growth assessments by 2014 to 15. The district supports opportunities for pupils to receive post-secondary credit while attending secondary school pursuant to section 22F1E. The district offers online instruction programs or blending learning opportunities to all eligible pupils pursuant to section 22F1F. The district pro provides a link on the district's homepage to the URL for the MI uh, school data portal which will contain the dashboard uh, required dashboard indicators pursuant to section 22F1G if certain data elements for our district are unavailable from state data collections. We agree to provide those data in the form of the manner de determined by the MDE. Number two, um, the Board of Education of the Midland Public Schools authorizes and directs its secretary to file this resolution with the state aid and school finance office of the Michigan Department of Education. And lastly, number three, all resolutions and part of these resolutions insofar as they conflict with the provisions of this resolution are hereby rescinded. Resolved this 11th day of February 2013. I'll accept a motion for approval of the resolution. I move we approve the resolution, the best practice and inclusive resolution. Moved by Treasurer Branstad. Do we have a second? I'll second, please. Second by Member Gordon. Um, any questions or discussion pursuant to the resolution? Nope. I'd make one comment. It's great that we've had the foresight to have most of these in place, not just recently, but long ago and over the years. This is a, it's a gratifying to know that. And, uh, and that some of the ones that maybe weren't there as robust are becoming very robust, like the technology. So it's, it's great to see. Okay, so uh, this requires a roll call vote. So, Secretary, will you call the roll? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Vice President Baker? Yes. Secretary Kaminsky? Yes. Treasurer Brandstand? Yes. Member Gordon? Yes. Member McFarland is absent. Member Vanderkelt? Yes. Okay. 6 0. We have approval of the resolution. Uh, please submit it in a timely fashion. Yes. <laughs> I've got my, my pen driving here by the first month as secretary. And from that, we'll move on to item 4.3 to uh, both Carl and Linda on the budget uh, adjustments mid year. Well, every year, by, by law, we have to uh, amend budgets um, within certain timelines and when we know they need to be amended. Mrs. Klein spends a great deal of her time, um, really beginning way back in December, making sure the rest of us know that if we're going to amend our budgets, we better do it by her deadline. She, um, she's very good at that, and she gets compliance from almost all of us uh, in the district for doing so. And then we bring that to you, and it's the uh, first of two. Generally, it's the first of two budget amendments. The uh, last one will come right prior to the end of the school year. Typically, we do that at the um, June meetings. And um, with that, I turn it over to her, and she will walk you through this. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ellinger. Uh, you do have a great deal of detail that was in your board packet. So this is a summary of what's there. Because it's rather difficult as you're looking through the, the high level of detail that you see to know when a line item changes. Was it truly an increase to the budget or a decrease to the budget? Or was it just money moving from one category to another? And there's a lot of reasons why that happens. So the purpose of this presentation is to summarize that for you and help you see where the big changes truly are. Because there are changes in the overall budget. Our timeline was we had the board budget workshop back on April 30th. Uh, the budget that we are currently operating under was proposed to you and we held a public hearing on June 11th. You took action on June 25th, which put us in legal compliance, having a fully adopted budget in place before the beginning of the fiscal year on July 1. So here we are on our mid-year revision, and I anticipate that we'll do the final revision on June 24th. And looking ahead, we are talking about having the audit during the week of July 22nd. 
that will put us on target to have our audit presentation in September. And at that point, we're able to fully close the books on the 2012-13 budget year. <coughs> uh, here's a snapshot of where we are. We started the year expecting revenues of $75,650,000. Uh, with our revision, we've seen an increase of $1.3 million, so we're anticipating $76,969,000 in total revenues. Expenditures have declined by $529,000, so they've dropped from $82,699,000 to $82,170,000. And the shortfall, if we were to spend the full amount of the budget, has dropped from $7 million to $5.2, or a decrease of $1.8 million. But really, after normal variance, we would expect to reduce the general fund balance by $2.3 million, <coughs> which will leave us with $10.9 million, or 13.3% of our annual operating expenditures in our fund balance. Now, here's where the big changes are. Uh, since June, these are revenues that we did not know, we couldn't have anticipated. They came after the fact. And I've broken it down into two categories. One are those pieces that are included in the 13-14 projection, and then those that are one time. And so they've been taken out of the forecast for next year. because. The official budget has a column, I put it in bold print for the 12-13 amended budget, but then next to that I have the projection as we know it today for 13-14. And the latter half of this presentation will walk you through some of the early assumptions and what we believe we know about that right now. Uh, so as you heard earlier, the technology infrastructure came about uh, later in the fall. And total for the district was $81,000. And we were notified of that, I believe it was in the last month. I think it showed for the first time on our January state aid payment. Uh, we're going to receive $81,000 or $10 per pupil, and that's to help move us toward being able to do the smarter balanced assessment in the 14-15 time frame. And the reason I have it broken up is that last Thursday, <laughs> The beginning of the state budget cycle was underway when the governor released his executive budget proposal for the 13-14 school year. It's the state's 2014 fiscal year, uh, but the process is, is he introduces <coughs> his recommendation, and then over the course of the next few months, the House and the Senate will each release their own and they'll work collectively to come up with what will ultimately be known as the State School Aid Act. And in the governor's version of the budget that was released on Thursday, there was still a small amount of money left for technology infrastructure grants, but it looked like it was at about 27% of the level of the current year. So this is just a pure estimate on my part based on what I saw in the governor's budget, that if we received 81 thousand dollars this year or ten dollars per pupil and it's at 27 percent next year it, we would expect about 27 percent of what we have uh, we also had some state categoricals that are larger than we originally budgeted the first is for what's called the MIPSERS offset and that's money that the state provides to help offset the increase in the retirement payroll rate and the reason we couldn't be any closer with that is because it's based on what percent our annual payroll was on September 30th as a percent of the total. So we had to have the close of the state's fiscal year in order for the calculation to take place. And so we had some extra money there. Uh, money for the Juvenile Care Center is always calculated a year after the fact. So we get our per pupil funding for the students who are there, and we get funding that's supposed to cover the added cost of the program the prior year, and then in the current year, it's adjusted for the prior year. So this is money that goes to support running the Juvenile Care Center in the 11-12 year. Next year, we'll get the 12-13. Uh, and then finally, there's a categorical that's supposed to uh, cover the costs of doing all the data collection that districts are required to do. 
And if you look at a status report, it's called the Headley Data Collection. And again, that's an amount that gets prorated across the state. So those three combined increased about 153,000. And I have reason to believe that they will all continue in one form or another for 13-14. So they are in the projection. Uh, we also have money that's transmitted to us from the Midland County Educational Service Agency. And we have a couple of different pots of money there. We have the Act 18 Special Education Millage. Act 18 refers to the state law that made it possible for the ESA to levy that millage. And that is a figure that they provide to us based on their estimates in their budget. So when they come and present to you in May, the numbers that they are giving to you are those numbers that we will put in our original budget. And they do exactly what we do. They do a mid-year budget revision. And in this current year, they've revised their budget. They anticipate distributing $85,000 more to us than they had originally put in their budget. Uh, they also have some prior year adjustments. This is a process that has gone on for years where they will distribute millage to the locals. They will also charge the millage or charge the locals tuition for the students in the countywide programs. Uh, the mismatch between the two is either additional revenue to us or what's called the bill back. And we've been in a bill back situation for a few years where the tuition exceeds what we receive for the total amount of the millage. Uh, and for a few reasons, they did not get to that adjustment last year or for the prior year or for that year. Uh, so they're making up for two years, which is why you're seeing it as a one-time revenue of 610000 now, there may be some adjustment that we build into the budget next year, just in anticipation, but it certainly won't be uh, along that magnitude because that's a two-year adjustment, and I expect that they're, they're caught up now and things will be much closer. Uh, we also had federal grants that <coughs> came in uh, $203,000 more than originally budgeted, and that's as a result of the federal fiscal year starting on October 1. So again, we have a lot of disconnects between our fiscal year when you have to have a budget that you've acted on on July 1, and then a lot of information that comes along after the fact. And the little C behind that is, means that there is a corresponding cost on the, in the expenditure budget. So you can't really look at it as extra money. Extra money came with a required extra expense. Uh, and then we've had, since 1999, an agreement with the city to provide programming on one of the cable access channels. We refer to it as MPS TV. And every year, the city provides uh, an amount of funding that covers some of our costs for doing that. In this most recent year, Mr. Cochran, who works on our programming, approached the city about funding some capital upgrades for the rather aging equipment. And so the city approved that, and on a one-time basis, we received almost $36,000 in order to replace some of our equipment. So in total, we have about $442,000 that's going to carry, I believe, will carry forward to next year. But then we also have $727,000 of additional funds in this current year that I have no reason to believe will carry forward to 13-14. Now on the expenditure side, organized the same way. The big change for us this year was when at the end of summer, the state acted on retirement reform, significantly changing the uh, structure of the retirement system, particularly for new employees. And we are now at a, we had one rate that went into effect. You may remember uh, all employees were to make an election about a rate, but there was an argument about whether the all employees were given enough time. And so some changes in the rates were held up. And instead of going into effect on October 1 or November 1, uh, the program did not go into effect until February 1. So we've had multiple retirement rates. And we are now at the point where depending on when an employee was hired and uh, what choices they have made, 
instead of having a single or two retirement payroll taxes that I might report to you, we now have seven different rates that can apply to an employee. Uh, but as a result of rolling that back, my estimate is that we probably were able to take out over $800,000 of what had been budgeted because when we had the State School Aid Act at the beginning of our budget cycle, at that time it stated that our rate was going to be 27.37% of payroll. And now it has dropped and it ranges anywhere from 24.32% to 26.96%. And when we have almost $50 million in payroll charges, a 1% change in that rate is half a million dollars. Uh, we also have done something that we typically don't do until later in the year, and it has made human resources very, very anxious to do this. Uh, we have, as a result of <coughs> many of our contracts, what we call the early notification stipend. And that is an allowance that is paid to someone if they notify us before March 1 of their intent to retire. And the reason we do that is that it allows us to move forward in a more orderly way with staffing and we can fill positions because, quite honestly, it could leave the district in major chaos if we had everyone not announcing they were retiring until the end of June with a fiscal year beginning on July 1. Uh, so HR budgets based on how many are eligible. This ought to be somewhat frightening to you to see that that much came out. We have a large number of employees district-wide who are eligible for retirement. Uh, and based on what we have seen so far, we feel comfortable removing that. Now, there's always a risk here because employees have until February 28th to notify us to qualify for the stipend. So there could be something that happens in the next two weeks that would cause me to come back at the end of the year budget adjustment and say, we adjusted too much out. We need to add it back. But we're pretty confident because not everyone who's eligible has any intention of, of retiring. Uh, we also were able to reduce the amount of money that was budgeted for paraprofessionals, and that was primarily in the area of special education. And then the other side of the ESA charges that I mentioned, the tuition, uh, their estimates are that the tuition for MPS will be about $55,000 less. So just a little over a million dollars in what I believe are ongoing reductions and the $221,000 uh, in one time because when we start the next budget year, we'll look again at those retirements. Uh, we also had some cost increases. And anything that had a revenue associated with it has an R after it. You can see we had the federal programs, the additional federal money came with the additional federal expenses. Uh, we had a small increase, not much, for classroom teachers. And I know that after we adopted the budget, we did end up adding at least a section of kindergarten and some smaller portions of FTE at the secondary buildings. So it looks like that will be the increase in cost to classroom teachers. Uh, the amount of money allocated for International Baccalaureate Supplies and Materials was increased, and the FB after that indicates that that's money that's been carried in fund balance from prior year gifts. Uh, we also had a workers' compensation settlement. That's a one-time increase of 73000 We had some gifts that carried over from 1112. They were in the reservation of fund balance. Uh, the Nice, even $50,000 there is the amount that was given to support the Taiwan trip at Midland High School. So that has been adjusted in. Uh, we had the TV upgrades and then our district-wide insurance, that's the property, casualty, vehicle, et cetera, ended up increasing about 35000 So we have about 371000 of increases that I think will carry forward to next year but another 204000 that were probably just one time and will come out. So that causes us to look forward. What does it mean for 1314? Well, we know we will have an enrollment decline. And I'll show you a chart <coughs> in a minute that 
breaks it down by levels, but it looks like it'll probably be about 171 in the actual count and maybe 157 in the blended count. And this coming fall will be the smallest birth cohort that we have entering kindergarten in Midland County. If we go back uh, as recently as 2001, there were 1,022 children born to Midland County residents. And in the year that we'll be entering kindergarten this fall, there were only 823. So a very, very small group. And on either side of that, somewhat larger, not anywhere close to the size that would lead to uh, sizes of our senior classes. But very good news, the state just released the 2011 figures. And the 2011 figures, of course, these aren't children who are going to be entering kindergarten for another four years, uh, are up to 908. Mm -hmm. So they're not at the higher level, but I feel as if we've reached the bottom. The numbers certainly indicate that. And we've probably picked up a little bit. So I don't think we're going to see kindergartens continue to get smaller other than this coming year. And we've worked with our enrollment estimator, and uh, he certainly confirms that. Uh, we've also had a change in state law that changes how children are going to be eligible for kindergarten. They are no longer eligible this coming year if they are five by December 1. They need to be five by November 1. And then the next year, they need to be five by October 1. And the next year, five by September 1. Initially, I was very concerned about that. I thought, well, there goes one twelfth of the kindergarten class. So I dug into the data, looked at some class lists, and found that <coughs> my guess is that parents of younger children have made the decision to not start them. Now, I don't know whether that's going to shift back to October. Uh, there's also a waiver process, so for any parent who really feels that their child born in November is ready for kindergarten, they will be able to enroll them. But I don't believe that this is going to have the huge impact that I initially did. Uh, for purposes of enrollment estimation, I'm only taking 10 kindergartners out just based on what I was seeing for the children born in November. Uh, we will have the one-time revenues that are gone. And then very troubling because we're not certain how it's actually going to be done uh, in a very you know, in nuts and bolts type way. The state is shifting toward pupil accounting not being those two count days. They tried to do it this year and then realized that the systems just didn't exist to make it possible. But to something that will be more of a daily attendance. And how we will know what our count is until the year is over is a mystery at this point because the system will be such that a student could attend Midland Public from September through November and we could get credit for them for their funding for that time period and then if they move and go to another district that other district as long as it's within the state of Michigan and is another public school could claim a prorated share of their foundation for that time. So a lot of uncertainty about how that's going to work. Every district in the state has a different information system, and there's not a lot of uh, communicating back and forth across districts electronically. And originally it was in this year's State Aid Act, but as we got into the year, I think the data people at the state said to the legislature, we can't make this work. And so they put it on hold for a year. But it's back in for the proposal for next year. So creates a lot of uncertainty about what the per pupil will look like. Uh, here's where the enrollment is right now. And it looks like, as you can see, uh, decline. Not as much at the elementary. You're beginning to see the larger drops now at the secondary as the smaller elementary classes make their way up. 
Uh, and these are estimates, and you'll notice the little asterisk at the bottom to be refined upon completion of the second official count. Next week, February 13, is the second official count, and the blended count is 90% of this coming fall and 10% of this spring. So for purposes of the very preliminary budget, I've used 90% of the figure provided by our enrollment consultants, uh, Stanford Associates, and I'm just estimating right now, and I'll refine this once we have our official number from the spring. And you can see that the drop since 2001-2 of 17.6%, and that is almost an exact match to the drop we've seen in the county birth rates. Just a almost a, a perfect match, and I, I always bring that chart to you when we do the board budget workshop. I just updated it today. Uh, on the revenue side, this is very difficult to tease out, but there is an increase in the retirement rate in the governor's budget. Part of the retirement reform was to keep the district contribution steady but it also appears that there is possibly some more offsetting revenue. So for this very preliminary look forward, I'm offsetting what I think that increase in the rate will mean in the increase in, in the offsetting payment on state aid. So I'm not sure that's how it will work, but that's the way the language looks to me right now. And, of course, this all has to go through the meat grinder of the legislative process. So, of course, as we get farther along, that could just go out the window completely. Uh, reducing the technology infrastructure grant, the best practices that you just acted on, those same best practices with a little bit of tweaking are also in the governor's recommendation for 1314 except they've been dropped from $52 per pupil down to $16 per pupil. So I'm fairly confident we will qualify for them, but we'll only be receiving $16 per pupil. Our drop in enrollment, blended count, 157, is almost 1.3 million. Uh, there is absolutely no increase for MPS in the foundation. You may have seen some numbers thrown about last week. There are some equity payments for districts whose per pupil funding is below 7,000. And you may have seen some things about two plus percent increases in the overall state school aid. Uh, it's going to fund some of these other pieces. It does not translate into a two percent increase in the foundation. Uh, early word from the folks at state government who work on this is that we will not see a foundation increase until 2017. Hopefully things will change perhaps before that time, but right now that's the, what the mindset we should have. Uh, we also have the one-time revenues that will be going away. So overall, expect the revenues to drop from just under $77 million down to probably 74580000 And I did not include, there's a $100 per pupil incentive for student achievement that's also in the State School Aid Act. Uh, we did not qualify this current year. It was based on, if I get this right, I think 10-11 NEEP data, and it was a very complicated formula. Uh, it is also in for 1314 using 1112 data, and the best we can do, clearly we can't go back and change anything about 1112, will be to wait to see what the estimates are coming out of the state, because once this goes through the process, the House and the Senate fiscal analysts will do an estimate district by district, and we'll know before we go into budgeting whether we can count on that $100 or not, but that's not in any of my projections right now. Good news is on the expenditure side. And it's early now, but it looks as if uh, our increases from the salary schedule steps <coughs> and the elimination of the furlough days may be offset with the implementation of the formula that we negotiated and the retirements that we expect. 
too early to say for certain, but that's the early look at it. But the good news there is, is instead of reporting to you that we're going to see expenditure changes of 2, 3, 4 percent, I think it's going to be either minimal or a wash. Same thing on the retirement side. This is the first year that I can remember when I've not reported to you that we are looking at adding one and a half or two million dollars in expenses because of an increase in the retirement rate. Uh, the contribution rate did go up on average 0.43 percent, but it looks as if there's some sort of an offset. And if not, 185,000 may be our increase there. So uh, just tweaking some of the expenditures and some of the things I showed you, almost identical to where we are this year. So where that will leave us is I believe we will end this year with 10.9 million in fund balance. Uh, on paper, if you look at those revenues and those expenditures, we'd have an operating shortfall of about 7.6 million. And after we have our usual variance, it's more likely to be 4.7 or 4.8, which would leave us about 6 million in fund balance on June 30th. And actually, I should say 2014 there. So that would be a year later. And that would be about 7.5% of our expenses. Now, here's all the disclaimers. These are the key elements that will drive us forward as we're working on the 13-14 budget. And when we do preliminary estimates, when we do the final that we have to put into the 13-14 budget, and then when we know for certain. So let's start with enrollment. I've already done a preliminary estimate. I'll do a final estimate for the budget workshop in April because by then we will have completed the supplemental count day and we'll have an idea of what registrations are looking like at all of the buildings. But we don't know for certain what our enrollment is until we get to November because we have the official count day in October, but then it takes 30 days to certify that. And we have a very complex count that does take that full 30 days. So we won't know until November. Uh, state funding, this is ongoing. Every time a legislative body introduces a budget recommendation, I churn the numbers through to see what they mean to Midland Public because we may need to communicate that with our local legislators. Uh, typically that goes on February through April. And generally, we don't know much for certain until we get to late May because in mid-May the state holds what's called the Revenue Estimating Conference or Consensus Conference. And that gives all of the legislative bodies the idea, the best idea of the money that they have going forward into their 2014 fiscal year. Uh, depending on the year, we've known for certain in June. And we've known, I was optimistic, I said October because that's the beginning of the State School Aid Act. But we have had changes that to the State School Aid Act that took place in November and in January. But ideally, I think there's a commitment at, in Lansing to try to get that information to districts in June so that you can make informed budget decisions. Uh, staffing levels, we typically work on in May. And there are, as I alluded to earlier, there are some changes that happen over the summer. Enrollments change. But generally by August, we're, we're pretty settled in what our staffing will be. Uh, our MCEA contract, I'll be estimating throughout the spring the cost of that contract. But because of the nature of the formula, which calls for not finalizing it until after the audit, we won't know for certain what the outcome of that will be until we get to September. So the budget will have to be based on an estimate. Uh, we are currently in negotiations with MSESPA and we'll be beginning with MFP. So we'll do some estimates for the budget workshop, but we won't know for certain until we reach ratification. Uh, unaffiliated staff wages we'll work on in the March-April time frame. And ha we'll have those pretty final by those assignments happen a little more quickly, generally by May. And the salary letter comes to you in June. Uh, the retirement cost is tied to staffing. 
And because of the strange nature of all the rates and its dependence on choices that employees make, we won't know for certain what those are until we've completed the year. We'll have a pretty good idea of where they are, but a uh, little different story than it's been to uh, forecast retirement. <coughs> and medical, uh, I do ongoing estimates. I had Connect Care give me trend numbers last week, and I'll just be watching it across the spring. But again, we don't know for certain until we reach the end of the year. But we'll do an estimate based on where we are this year and apply the trend to that, and that's what will go into the 13-14 budget. Uh, the ESA transfer monies, the Act 18, the Medicare, the enhancement millage, uh, typically they bring that budget to you in early May. Those are the figures we'll have. And then when they amend their budget in January, those will be the final figures that we put into our 13-14 budget. And then the available fund balance, of course, we estimate it every time we do a budget revision, and we know for certain after we've completed the, the audit. So since each of these has the potential to cause large, large, large variations uh, in the projections, I'm not presenting this to you with an idea that you need to act on any sort of reductions now to try to narrow that shortfall but just to be aware that these are the kinds of things that we'll be looking at and discussing over the course of the spring. And as odd as it seems, it's probably one of the more optimistic projections that we've looked at over the last few years. So with that, happy to take questions. Lord's pleasure. Like you said, it's a, it's kind of a less doomsday type of uh, appearance to the our future budget coming up. Um, you know, thank you to everybody that's contributed. I mean, all the um, you know, all the employee groups or teachers, administrators. It's it's been um, taking some pressure off, but obviously the most troubling figure out of that is the 1.3 million reduction in per pupil funding. Although the expenses are stable that reduction in, in revenue is very troubling. So um, hopefully we can do everything we can to um, try to keep the students that we have, try to gain more, showcase some of our world-class uh, approaches in education and so forth, so to, to minimize that. But it's birth rate related, and hopefully it, eventually we're going to see the bottom of that, but that's quite a big hit. Um, we've seen worse scenarios, but it's just uh, very much appreciated the contributions and. We're still not done dealing with our upside down budget. So it could be worse. Anybody else? Well, I'd like to see a class size analysis um, across the district. Who would do that? Mr. Verlindy or? You want to comment on yeah, that? Yeah, we are currently looking at FFO. The last FFO meeting, we had quite a discussion on the drivers. We start with the drivers and how it works. Um, and we're starting to exhume the data of what it looks like on a class-by-class -class basis. Uh, FFO will be coming back to the board sometime over the course of the next several months of recommendations for next year on class size. Uh, one of the, Some of the things we have learned uh, as, a, as a committee at the last meeting was it's not as simple as just what is class size that you want. Uh, as soon as you start opening all the buildings to, you can go to the school you want, you can go to take the classes you want at that school, and you can have the schedule you want, all of a sudden it's hard to reconcile class size and have all those other three things come true also. So something has to give in that equation uh, or uh, tons of dollars to solve it. So, so one of the things that we are talking about is what drivers do you want to maintain uh, versus uh, the class size, et cetera, what flexibility do you want to maintain in doing that? Because a lot of kids will, if you split a section in two, this is an example, uh, now sir, half that class won't get the schedule they wanted for other things they wanted. And so are you better served for having a slightly larger class size or busting the two where kids can't get the schedule they want? Or do you say, that's enough, we can't have any more in this school to keep that class size where it is? So there's lots of other drivers, and we're trying to come to 
an understanding of those drivers so that we can come back to the full board with recommendation and options. And will you hopefully have a policy for class size? I don't know that. Because uh, if you constrain one of those four variables, by definition, you've constrained the system. So you may have guidelines versus policies. You may uh, talk about what your intent is. But what we learned from that is if, if you constrain a multivariable system, some other variable's got to pop out. And it may be a variable you don't want to have pop out. Like, oops, sorry, enrollment's closed at this school because we can't do that anymore because we want to keep class size in that school to a certain limit where a parent might be just as happy if their child's in a, if you, I'm just pulling numbers out, if you had a class limit of 26 and their kid was going to be the 27th and you say, sorry, uh, no can do, can't offer you that class, and oh, by the way, can't offer you that schedule, they may very well love to have had 27 in their class and still had that opportunity. So we have to, we're, we're mission through this. Very, it, I've heard, you know, administration said repeatedly it's complex after going through the first session. It is complex in, turn, in terms of not just doing and executing, but in terms of what the unintended consequence of a firm policy about something will be when it can pop out somewhere else and you're wondering why did that happen. So we want to understand that before we come back with recommendations. Anyway, that's where FFO is. Anybody else want to care to comment beyond that? Oh, how we got ourselves into this position, though, Jerry, is that, I mean, financially, yep. uh, money's not been an issue for Midland Public Schools. So it's easy to offer all those options um, to parents. And where we find ourselves now is we have to be very careful with the money that's available and at the same time keep our community happy by having all those options. I, and uh, there's an easy way to fix it, develop policy um, that says it's going to be X number per class, but I can guarantee you um, that won't be a popular option with a number of our parents that like having um, Other choices. all those options available to them. Yeah. So I think we can get there. Uh, we, we promised um, we would come back to the FFO. If you just look at the class size section by section across the district, without understanding those four factors that Mr. Wasterman, uh, Wasterman alluded to, it misrepresents how we got there. And that is a very complex issue, but I think the logical time for us to talk about it is after a couple more sessions at FFO and prior to budgeting for next year. Well, is there anything we can do about class sizes that are over a maximum of like 35 at the seventh grade level? And can we look at that uh, Jefferson class sizes across the building? Because I think that's really unacceptable to have class sizes of 35 if we're going to hold ourselves to our shared vision of world class standards. Can, can you talk to us more about what your perception of class size is well, in the and district? And that's why we need the data to look at it. So I'm in Jefferson, middle school is one I'm specifically interested in, but the entire district would be wonderful. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. It's, uh, uh, I think, do we have to? Oh, we have, have to vote on the yeah. budget. <laughs> That's right. Duh. All right. I tried, Linda. <laughs> 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 um, I'll accept a motion. So I move to accept the mid-year budget adjustment. Uh, motion by Treasurer Bransett. Any second? Second. Second by uh, Vice President Baker, any co more comments or questions on the mid-year adjustments to this year's budget? Are these the final adjustments for the year? There's no way to... No, the end of June. You'll have another another one that we legally have to do is by the end of yeah. June mm -hmm. prior to the end of the year. And that's a common practice. I, I mean, mean, all school districts amend their budget mid-year, and then yep. by law you have to, have do, to do it, it before the end of the year. Silent which is kind of the inane one, but. So yeah. we can and address the class sizes that are currently an issue if we pass this budget right now. Is that what you're saying? The address to the class size issue mm -hmm. is, I won't say independent of the budget. What could happen is you could come to a decision, the board could come to a decision at any time in the middle of a year to do something different than a budget calls for but it will have a budget ramification okay. that the board will have to recognize. Okay, So it, both directions. You can, in the middle of the year, 
decide you need to slash your costs and do something, you can have some of the middle of the year that decides to add to your costs and do something. The budget doesn't restrict what you do, but ultimately the dollars restrict what you do. And you have to make a decision based on that when you get there. So passing this budget does not preclude an evaluation of class size or, or moving on to other things. Okay. Any other questions before we vote? Seeing none, I'd like to do a roll call vote. Would you do a roll call vote on this sure. one? Sure. Okay. Uh, President Wasserman? Yes. Vice President Baker? Yes. Secretary Kaminsky? Yes. Treasurer Brandstam? Yes. Member Gorton? Yes. Member McFarland is absent. Member Vanderkellen? Yes. 6 0. Thank you very much. I think I finally got that right, Linda. So I can now move on to the rest of the finance uh, uh, agenda, and that. Uh, is Angela with an FFO report. All right, we met last Monday night and it didn't disappoint for an <laughs> FFO meeting. We met for four hours. Um, we went over lots of different topics. We discussed the de December financial reports. Um, January ones were not complete yet. We discussed the um, agenda resolution that John um, read tonight on best practices. We um, looked at some results of um, proposals for audited services that were done, I think, Linda, did you say by Claire Gladwin? ISD actually put for um, several districts in our area. So we looked through those, and we're going to wait um, to make a decision on auditing services till after we make a decision if we're going to go forward with the bond and our sinking fund um, election. Um, we went through a lot of information about the proposal for a sinking fund, which we have discussed this evening. Um, we also had a nice discussion by Linda on the mid-year budget adjustments that we just discussed. Um, we began a discussion on um, determining allocation of instructional staff and how that affects class size. Um, so that was a very uh, robust dialogue on that. And the next time we meet will be um, on Monday, March 4th. Any questions of Angela? See none, I'll turn it uh, over to I'm oh. sorry, one other one. Could you guys consider um, applying for the ASBO Meritor Meritorious School Budget Award? Some of the best high school, some of the best districts in the state they apply for it and they win the award. But which committee should consider that, Carl? Should be FFO? Should be FFO. Okay, yes, we will we will consider that. Uh, one of the things just as a preview going into that that I would be concerned about is A, the degree of effort it takes mm -hmm. to distract from other efforts just to get a blue ribbon for something our auditors tell us we do very good at. But but it would be worth the while if it's a minimal effort. That would be my, my image going into the FFO. Well, meeting. and Dave Youngstrom works with Bloomfield Hills public schools to help them win that award and I know we're yep. considering working with him so yeah he will be our new auditor so it'll just be a function of as we discuss it what resources are required right. to what benefit yeah. so we'll look into that. Okay. okay that said we'll move on to Ms. Klein on donations yes thirteen thousand one hundred twenty three dollars and thirteen cents there's something about those numbers that I just, I like the <laughs> symmetry of it all. <laughs> uh, we have uh, two donations from the East Lawn Elementary Student Supplemental Education Endowment Fund at the Midland Area Community Foundation. Uh, actually, we have a number of gifts from various donor funds at the Community Foundation. Uh, but we also have a gift from the H.H. Dow High School Athletic Booster Club as well as a number of gifts from the Dow Music Boosters. Uh, we have the Midland County Violence Prevention Partnership Project, which is also a fund at the Midland Area Community Foundation. And that's supporting the week of nonviolence activities at a number of our schools. Gifts from the Siebert and Woodcrest PTOs. And then a gift from the Peter J. Kendall Donor Advised Endowment Fund at the Community Foundation to support the Dow High Update trip to New York City to receive the Columbia Scholarship Press Association Crown Award. And finally, a gift from the Midland Rotary Club uh, to support their parent gathering room and some of the equipment 
in that room. Uh, we also have a donation of items. J.R. Heinemann and Sons donated some one by eights and one by sixes of red oak for the Midland High School Woodshop Club. So we thank all of our donors. A uh, number of very generous items that most districts would give their eye teeth to receive in the course of a month. Thank you very much and thank you to the donors again. Taxpayers and donors have been wonderful in this district historically. We'll move on to human resources. I'll turn it over to Mr. Valindi. Thank you. We have some retirements that have been announced. Uh, Ms. Paula Arthur, paraprofessional at Millard High, that's effective June 12th. Ms. R Ravon Boyle, office professional at Millard High School, effective June 28th. And uh, Ms. El Elizabeth Friedhoff, teacher at Plymouth Elementary, that's a June 13th effective date. And lastly, Ms. Julie Miller, paraprofessional at Seabird Elementary, uh, effective June 12th. And we thank all of them for their wonderful service to the middle public schools. Yes, thank you, Gary. I was going to add that at the end. And if I may um, add one more, I have a letter I'd like to read to uh, President Wasserman and members of the Board of Education. This is not a surprise to our Board of Education. I think uh, Jerry reached out to all of you today. Um, and I've communicated with our administrative staff as well as our uh, full district employees here in the district. Um, dear Mr. Wasserman and members of the Board of Education, after having honorably served as superintendent of schools for Midland Public Schools for the past six years, I'd like to inform you of my impending retirement from public education, effective July 1, 2013, with my last work day being June 30th, um, 2013. Um, as you know from our recent conversations of the past six weeks regarding this decision, Mr. Wasserman, it's been my sincere de desire or pleasure to have served as an educational leader, one among many in our district since my association with MPS. This district has been, currently is, and will continue to be a district of distinction, providing an excellent 21st century education to the students and community we serve. I would like to think I have added to that quality during my tenure, and if so, it adds to my pride to have worked for this school district. These past six years certainly have been challenging times for education here in Midland, and across the state of Michigan. Our employees have faced those challenges, made personal and professional sacrifices in addressing them, and continued to de dedicate themselves to young people in quality education. I'm particularly indebted to the administrative team here at MPS. They're outstanding educational leaders committed beyond belief to Midland Public Schools. When I joined the district um, six years ago, or I, when I joined the district years ago, Mr. Wasserman, I recall you inquiring about how long the Board of Education could count on my staying here in the Midland community as superintendent. I answered by stating six years, and that time has now come to a close. This decision is not an easy one to make, as you well know, but I feel that it's time to move my personal and professional life to a more healthy next stage. I wish you personally, the Board of Education, our superb school district, and the greater Midland community all my best in pursuing the future educational goals that are so important to our constituents who are genuinely interested in the best interest of Midland Public Schools. So it's been a pleasure to be here. Um, lots of changes in public education in the last six years and in our district recently. And I look forward to um, getting some downtime and pursuing some other interest here in the community. We don't have any intent to move away. And as many of you know, my wife works for MidMichigan Community College, so we're going to stay here in the community, and I look forward to watching this district um, continue to grow and progress and maintain its <coughs> distinction as a school district. It's been a pleasure to work with this Board of Education over the years. I'd like to say thank you, but it's hard to say thank you to that, but thank you for your service. Any comments? <laughs> Kind of messy. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for everything. You're welcome. Carol, I, we're not enough. You've done so much for this district, and I've appreciated your leadership style, your constant communication with all of us, and you've been a, a wonderful mentor, as is your team here, and I will definitely miss you. You will be hard shoes to replace. Thanks. Well, and congratulations, and um, I look forward to your retirement parties. Many retirement parties. I would love to host one. <laughs> Well, being the 
So Lynn and I were there when we hired Carl, and Lynn went to Charlotte with us when we did our site visit, the three the three member site visit committee. And uh, if I had any doubts about hiring, hiring Carl at that point in time, they were certainly allayed when we sat in a meeting and a board member and a teacher basically broke down in tears wishing Carl would not leave. And I went, wow, that's the kind of guy we need. Everything else had added up in the interviews, everything else had added up on paper, but to see that kind of dedication from that community and what Carl had done to that community uh, just made that sure. Um, a for sure decision on our part. That said, times changed immensely as Carl came into the district. The uh, state of Michigan changed immensely. Um, financing became the number one driver for the last five years, unfortunately. Uh, but you can't educate kids if you don't have budget and you're doing radical things versus gradual things over time to do that. And Carl, I thought, very adroitly led us through that picked the spots that had the least impact on kids first and worked our way towards those things that may have started touching kids but certainly didn't have radical change to uh, what we offered and what we did. And forever I'll appreciate you, Carl, guiding us through that. Um, there's a lot of kids, mine including, that benefited from your stewardship and uh, we're going to miss you. And while you may be retiring, you're not retiring to June 30th, as you adroitly said in your letter. Uh, we have a bond issue that's coming up in all potential uh, if we vote for it on February 20th. I have no doubt Carl's going to lead us through that in a very adroit and uh, energetic level that he wants that uh, for this district. And it's not leader dependent, it's what we want for the district and uh, Carl will lead us through that. So thank you Carl. And uh, while I'd like to say not thank you like I started my comments, I don't have much to talk since I did the same thing just three years ago. And so I understand exactly what you're thinking, uh, and uh, welcome to the world of, of uh, so-called retirement. Thanks so much. And uh, you won't see any change on my part between now and, and June 30th, but big change after that. Yes. <laughs> That's great and good for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Um, you'll see correspondent listing to the Board of Education on the, on the agenda. I also like to highlight for the public and for the board members as, a, as, a remember, as jog memories on February 20th, I think that's next Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we have the special meeting here at 5.30 to uh, do a final vote on resolution to put both the sinking fund and the technology bond millage on the ballot. So uh, hopefully everyone can attend that. And with that, we'll move into study discussion and session and uh, see, I began on my right last time, so I'll begin on my left this time. Kim, we'll start with you. Oh, well, for study, I would love to give everyone one of these books, Exam Schools. It's the top 50 schools in the nation and how they got there. I gave one to Sean already. So. I actually works out really well right now. And other than that, I want to thank all the effort from the students and the parents and the teachers for the fruit sale, the music fruit sale. Um, we ordered some and had it hand delivered by the students and it just shows passion for our schools and I really appreciated it. And along that line, I uh, have a friend that was involved with that and of course it was the snow day and uh, the story she shared and how they got the fruit and delivered the fruit and everything in between. So congratulations to all of them. That's a big, huge event and, and um, it supports a wonderful music program. And uh, with Chris and, and Blake still sitting in the back there, thank you for your presentation. It's very exciting. Some of you may have heard me say this before, but one of my daughters was uh, at Chestnut Hill, third grade, when they put the first pilot computer lab in. And uh, she's 24 now and very adept at CAD and everything else. But uh, Yvonne probably remembers those days too. Before that, we had computers pushed in the hallway and uh, those were our mini computer labs. So we've come a long way in, in that short time. And uh, obviously it's an unending and never changing computer world out there. Um, and lastly, I, I um, haven't gone all last week, but I saw uh, 
that this week is the week of violence uh, prevention, and so there are lots of wonderful activities and, and information being shared with our students. And for all those that are involved with that, thank you for your efforts and participation. It's something we never grow old, too old to learn about and um, to share with our children. Yeah, I'm just thinking of uh, you know the topics we talked about tonight, the budget, the uh, the uh, potential bond, the sinking fund, and so forth. And I just think about how long we've come to get to this point. I mean, I think back to um, you know with uh, Blake coming in and presentations to FFO and going through all that uh, you know the, the thinking of looking at best practices and looking at what consultants say, uh, surveying the community to find out uh, the appetite and the um, the commitment and the expectations uh, about their school district for these these topics. Um, I just think it's, and then you look at the timeline that was on the PowerPoint presentation tonight uh, that outlined all the steps and all the work that we've done, Treasury down in Lansing and so forth. So it's just appreciated having a team effort towards that and looking at how the community as a team has uh, supported uh, for 10 years looking at the projects that were completed for the school district. And I feel definitely a sense of responsibility to have that go forward. I, you know, I just think about the age of the buildings, the projects that we need to complete, um, and where technology can take us. And I, I definitely think that going through the process and going through um, how badly that is needed, and looking at what other districts have done with bonds, uh, you know, I'm definitely I'm hoping that our board is uh, supportive of, of that. And I know we've had some good messaging from the community supporting that too as well. Um, on, on budget, um, it's. Uh, it, it's never a pretty picture. I don't think it's going to improve for many, many years, but um, it's just the times that we're in. But the budget could be worse without the contributions of all of our stakeholders in the district, um, from parents doing more, contributing more, um, all of our um, employee groups, uh, wages, salaries, and everything else. I just, it's just, you don't hear that enough to how much that's appreciated, because that, that budget out could, outlook could look worse. All right. First of all, I want to thank you so much for your presentations tonight. I know we spent a lot of time discussing an FFO, but the technology one was great. I really think that that is such a great uh, position for us to put ourselves in. I know my children already use so much technology, and it would be so great if there was even more of that out there. I know my son is blessed to have a couple teachers right now in high school who, based on the other classes they teach, he's actually in computer labs for his classes, and he's just told me how you know they do use them quite a bit and how much more we could do with students and I know on a daily basis how much I use technology in my job and how important it is for the kids to have that basis um, going forward and um, that's probably about it for me tonight <laughs> well I just want to echo what everyone else said about how I keep hearing the word exciting about the technology it is very exciting but what keeps coming back to me, though, too, is something Angela said, how she uses so much technology in her own job. What we really have to, it, it is very exciting, but what we have to think about is that we, we have to do this for these kids because this is the world they live in, and they're going to live in, and we have to prepare them for the world they're going to live in, not where we came from, but the world they're going to live in. So I think it's very exciting. Um, also, I want to say to Mrs. Klein, thank you so much for your presentation. I was just sitting here thinking, how, I wonder how many hours went into putting that together. But thank you so much for always presenting things in a way that makes sense to me. I really appreciate that. And um, I just also want to say, again, thanks for everything, Carl. And uh, especially, you know, how you just were so helpful to me during my first year as a board member. You, I think you really got me through it. You helped me so much. I really appreciate that, all the phone calls and the conversations and just the encouragement I got from you because so many times I felt so overwhelmed. I thought, oh, my goodness, what am I trying to do? But um, I really appreciate your support so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Von. Um, I have a few things to comment on. First of all, with Carl's announcement, uh, uh, many of you have heard a little bit of this from me, but time prohibited much. So we will begin a superintendent uh, search process. Uh, I want to assure the public um, it will be probably very similar to what we've done in the past, although we don't do it very often, so the institutional memory uh, wanes a bit. Um, we, will, we will probably likely bring in, we're going to try to bring in for the next board meeting, not the special meeting, the regular scheduled meeting, uh, four search firms, two Midland, uh, Midland Michigan-centric, and two national. 
of course, these guys are only as good as their local reps are, and so we'll, we'll discern that a little bit and bring them forward to give full presentations on not only what they've done, but how they conduct their searches, how they do the whole process. And for since most of you have not been involved in this process and before, uh, I'll just tell you all of them will involve a huge amount of community input, uh, which we're very used to in Midland. Uh, some of these guys come in almost apologetic, and we're very adroit at that. Uh, there will be sessions where they go out to many people in the public uh, to understand what they want in a superintendent, and then as part of the interview process uh, and selection process, have feedback in on that. And it, in the end, it's always, always a board decision on that selection. Um, most of the work will be done uh, as a board, as a committee of the whole. It uh, does not lend itself to subcommittees. Uh, the interviews are in public here in the boardroom. Uh, all those kind of things are very, very public. This is a very public process. Uh, some of the things I'll be asking of each of you as we go through this process, just to get in your head as we go forward, uh, once we hear the presentations from the search firms, and that's the key, getting the right search firm that know where the rocks are, know where to uncover them, uh, have the connections, and have the right process, uh, we're probably passing out tasks to each of you to follow up on their most recent placements, districts, uh, to the president of those school boards or whatever, ask how they worked with them, et cetera, to get some feedback before we make that decision. We did that last time. That worked out very nicely. So that'll be kind of the next steps. I won't talk any more about the steps on the general public involvement. I'm sure the public, it's going to be a huge involvement um, other until we see the processes these guys present to us and we choose from. But I can tell you right now, they'll all have heavy public involvement. Betty's well aware of that, and we wouldn't settle for anything less. As a matter of fact, that'll disqualify somebody if they don't even come close to what we want. Um, so that's what's to expect next. Hopefully we can get them in in two weeks, and then hopefully we can do quick reference checks, and then we probably would likely have to call a special board meeting to pick them so we don't lose time. Uh, but that'll be the next step. Um, next comment, Booster Bash uh, is starting its uh, activities. Uh, if you're approached, I hope you give them every attention you can. Uh, it's been a great be the second year, and it's a great, just like the music parents have done for years, the athletic parents are doing. That's great. We need to support them. Hope the community supports them. Um, and then lastly, on the millages, um, you all talk, spoke of the technology, and I won't go into that. And you all spoke of the benefits of the sinking fund, and I won't go into that. Uh, you spoke earlier on those. I would like to hope the taxpayers feel that they can trust us to be good stewards of their money. Uh, I hope we've earned that as we went through in the past and how we spent the money on the sinking fund, how we cut the tax millage on that to enable the uh, operating funds to the enhancement millage so we don't take taxing lightly. And when we do tax, we certainly want to use the funds in a way a community would consider very well done. And so I uh, uh, hope the folks out there will pay attention to that as we go forward. Uh, it's going to be about three mills total between the two, if I'm correct, Linda? a little less than three. And so factor that in. Um, it's a lot cheaper than a new building. And it's certainly the way to the future for our kids. Uh, not doing that for our kids would be a disservice. And we get a little side benefit for those uh, that uh, are into the arcaneness of uh, school financing. We'll have some stuff that comes off our operating budget today that we do that's technology related. Not a whole lot. That will free up money for classes and kids and class size and all those other things we like to talk about. So um, hopefully uh, our voters will have that faith and confidence in us and pay attention to this as we go forward, what the benefits are in addition to the cost. Um, you know, an equally important item that I want to mention <laughs> in the time so you don't have to extend the media. Yeah, because I've got seven. <laughs> uh, this is the week. It's actually Principal's Week as declared by Governor uh, Rick Snyder. And I want to read a State of Michigan Certificate of Proclamation on behalf of the people of Michigan, I, Rick Snyder, Governor of Michigan, do hereby proclaim February 10th through February 16th, 2013 as Principals Week. Whereas energetic and inspiring school leadership is essential if teachers, schools, and districts are to implement college and career preparatory standards and assessments for Michigan students, and whereas K-12 school principals play a vital role in the success of students, and act as the liaison between the school and the community it serves, ensuring that parents and taxpayers are aware of student and school achievements. And whereas Michigan school principals are dedicated, quality educational professionals,
committed to providing sound leadership and guidance to their staff and students. And whereas during this week, we joined the educators, parents, and students throughout the Great Lakes State to raise awareness of the importance of educational leadership and to recognize and thank all principals working in Michigan school districts for the, their exemplary service. Now, therefore, I, Rick Snyder, Governor of Michigan, do hereby proclaim Sunday, February 10th through Saturday, February 16th, 2013, as Principals Week in Michigan. And we have a copy of this on night stock paper as well as another certificate with the tridge in the background. It might sound familiar. Uh, for each of our principals, which I'll be hand delivering them and thanking them for their um, years of service to MPS. And uh, I'm sure their staffs will do something as well. They typically do. We have a great cadre of principals right now. Can't, can't yes, say enough. Do. And the other thing I would mention, um, because I have five minutes left, is the uh, MPS Week of Nonviolence um, begins today. Uh, the goal for the Week of Nonviolence is for students to understand the damage that can be done through bullying and violent behavior. Most of the activities are designed to engage students to act in some way, whether it's spreading the co compliments instead of go gossip or pledging to take a stand against bullying. And if my understanding is we have an initiative going on in each one of our buildings um, that falls underneath the theme of this this week. So I'm really proud of our buildings for taking that on in the midst of everything else that they do. With that, Mr. Wasserman, I'll hold off until two weeks from today on the student recognitions and turn it back to you. Fair enough. Any other items for the good of the order? Seeing none, we stand adjourned and we'll see each other on February 20th for the special meeting.